Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. However, there have been a certain percentage of this volume of reports that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. very compelling evidence that we uh, we may not be alone, whatever that means. Characteristics appear to demonstrate advanced technology. Arrow is the culmination of decades of DOD intelligence community and congressionally directed efforts to successfully resolve UAP encountered first and foremost by U.S. military. Uh, there's really no way I can prove it without revealing my identity and getting myself into more trouble than I have already. Exactly what's going on up there? Well, there's several, uh, actually nine uh, flying saucers, flying discs uh, that are out there of extraterrestrial origin. And uh, they're basically being dismantled. Uh, some are, well, in various stages of, of completion, built from other parts, and they're being test flown and uh, uh, basically just analyzed. I was 29 years old, working on the most incredible project in the history of the world. No one has ever been able to show exactly what I saw with my own eyes, until now. Let's travel back in time to December of 1988 when this all started. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to Disclosure Team. I'm your host, Vinny Adams. The following is an interview with Luigi Venditelli. Luigi is the executive producer and director of Project Gravator. If you enjoy this content, please take a second to subscribe, hit that like button, comment down below, or share it with your friends. I hope you enjoy this interview with Luigi Venditelli. Luigi, thank you so much for joining me. How are you? Hey, I'm great. How are you? Thanks for having me, by the way. Yeah, not bad at all. Ah, my pleasure. No, I'm really excited to talk with you about this project. So before we sort of dive into Project Gravitor, can we, uh, could you just tell us a little bit about your background and, and what sort of led you to this project? Uh, okay, well, uh, well, first off, there's, there's, I guess, two things to say is I'm, I'm the president of Motivo, which is our parent company, and we're, we're merchandisers and brand 
we, we've been doing branding and merchandising for about close to 25 years. So I spent a big part of my life in China, learned a lot of things out there, brought it here. Uh, so that's on my professional career side. Then there's the, uh, the research side on the, on this phenomenon, whether that be related to crafts in the sky, whether they're called UFOs, UAPs, whatever they want to call it today, all the way to, um, alien contact or extraterrestrial entities. Uh, I was the youngest member of MUFON back in 1987, 1988, when I was very young and been involved in it pretty much throughout my entire life. I, I stepped away from MUFON years ago, but uh, eventually had become the national director of MUFON for Canada at a certain point. So I, I have a good idea of what the phenomenon is on many different in, in the spectrum of the phenomenon. So whether, it, you know, talking about people who see a light in the sky all the way to people who say something happened to them in the middle of the night and they saw some entities or something. So I've got a lot of experience on, on all that and uh, got to meet a lot of people throughout the years and been kind of quiet behind the scenes for a long time. And was a, it was, it got to a point where, I wanted to do something that had not been done before. I stepped away from the day-to-day -day investigations or the day-to-day -day, uh, research of it because I kind of felt that there was some level of, of it, it was rep repetitive at a certain point. There was nothing really coming out that was that new. Even when you're looking at things that the government are, is saying today, it's not really that new. It's not the first time the government says something and then steps away or whatever. And my experience with some of the children that were witnessed to the Rua Zimbabwe case that I worked with for almost 10 years changed a little bit of my interest in how I wanted to bring my, how I wanted to contribute to this whole thing. And I basically founded an organization called We Are Not Alone. So it's wearenotalone.com. And it's, it's kind of a subdivision of our company. And it's about bringing, shedding light on this phenomenon, but in a different, a little bit of a, in a different way, and also sh uh, addressing the the trauma and the discrimination that has been, uh, you know, oftentimes associated to the people who have seen something, and have been discriminated against, and the trauma that that creates over time, and oftentimes, as much as people say that they're open to the phenomenon in in the sense of a light in the sky. Uh, a light in the sky is not that dangerous. It doesn't really change your belief systems. It's just a light in the sky. But the second somebody you know or love or are related to says that they saw some entities and these entities communicated with them and it traumatized them and they've been going through a lot of you know anxiety struggles over time, a lot of people who are oftentimes apparently going to support this are not going to support that aspect of it that easily because it breaks their construct of reality, their religious beliefs and so on. So there's, there was a, like an unsaid discrimination going on for, for a long, long time. And I wanted to address that. And that's where we are not alone is W A M A. So W A N A, sorry, WANA. And so it's the WANA movement. So basically putting a little bit of emphasis on let's not la laugh about this. It's real. Nobody really knows what it is. Anybody who says they absolutely know what it is, they're lying. They don't know what this is. Nobody does. Uh, but we do know that there's something. So that's important. And as I started WANA, one of the first things I wanted to do was come up with something that was not tacky, merchandise that was not tacky, something that was a lot of times people think if you're going to make merchandise about something, then it's, you know, it's, it's stupid. It's not, it's not serious, but that's not true at all. In fact, our entire social structure is affected by merchandise. If you're, if your sports team is something you really like, you probably have some merchandise from that sports team. If even if you're religious, I mean, I'm from my family's from Rome. If you're Catholic, you go to the Vatican and you could buy things that are related to the Vat to the Catholic religion. It's still a merchandise. There's still a factory somewhere making little Jesus statues. So that's merchandising. So there's a lot of seriousness to merchandising. But as soon as you bring it into this top in, in this world, all of a sudden it's cheesy. It's not cool. So I wanted to do something cool. And that was me wanting to create a professional model of a flying saucer, something that was 
really well done, a collector edition. And I, I thought, where would I start? Like, which one do we work with? I mean, there's a lot of people who saw them, but what the most interesting is who saw it inside, you know, like who went inside one of these. And there's a lot of people who have been inside according to their stories, but it's a very fine line between, I believe you to, I'm not sure, because there's not much evidence to support it. And the two main ones that I had on my list was Travis Walton and Bob Lazar. I know, I, I now know both of them. I knew Travis at the time. Uh, but when I looked at both their stories, Bob Lazar was the one that would have provided us a lot of material to actually build the interior accurately. So I took a chance. I reached out to United Nuclear where he works. I spoke to one of his colleagues there, Zach, who's a great guy, and asked, you know, look, I'm, I'm this guy out of Montreal. I know you guys don't know me, but I've been doing merchandise for a long time. I've done licensing. I'd love to make a professional flying saucer, and I'd love to work with the one that Bob Lazar worked on. And I would actually like to work with Bob so that we can act, make it an official product. He didn't know whether Bob was going to be interested or not, and, and eventually said he was going to ask him and let me know if there was an interest. Uh, a couple of day, a day later, a couple of days later, he called me back and he said, look, I spoke to Bob. We checked you out. He would like to talk to you. I guess they went and checked my website or stuff that we had done before. So Bob and I got on the phone and Bob interviewed me more than anything. It was it was a pleasure to talk to Bob Lazar, but he was the one asking me questions, you know, like, how long have you been doing this? How would you do? How would you do this? You know, so I went into a very deep dive into how you technically produce something like that, a die cast and how all that would come together. And I think it was like in the middle of that conversation, Bob goes, OK, I I figure I, I can understand, you know, what you're talking about, you know. And I said, well, I do. I've been doing this for a very long time. And he said, well, it sounds like you do. And it sounds like you're serious. So if you would like to do this, I would be pleased to help you out with that. And that's how it started. And so we got together two and a half years ago. And it went from him helping me give, give me the schematics of the flying saucer all the way to us not only wanting to build that as a model, but actually really building it for real at full scale with the entire base, with the entire Area 51 environment uh, in a super realistic 3D uh, project that we're, we're now turning into a documentary film and then a VR experience. So that's in a nutshell, in a big nutshell, that's the story. Oh, that's amazing. I mean, uh, obviously, we've we've seen documentaries featuring Bob Lazar in the past, and um, but this one, obviously, it does sound like it's going to be something. You know, it's going to have that additional, um, you know, information to back it up. This VR experience, and you're using Unreal Engine Five, I believe. Which right. could could yeah. you, for anyone that isn't aware of what that is, could you just briefly touch upon what it is and oh. why it's so so cutting edge? And it yeah, and it's important to talk about that. That's true because the the whole technology itself, the the engine that we're using, we we actually didn't start with Unreal Engine. It just if I, okay. if I step back, when we first started, we had to just build the craft. And for anybody who's familiar with this, uh, there's a software called Blender that you can actually build 3D models and and all that. And so that's how we began. We were using Blender, and as the craft was evolving, we thought, how about we build the hangar, the environment, because the idea we had was let's make a hyper professional, accurate model of the craft and then build a box and the box would be printed like the hangar that it was in. Right. So we thought, why not make the hangar accurate? So that also it required us to talk to Bob Moore and ask him a lot of questions. And as we started doing that, we started realizing, well, how about we just build it in Unreal and then have it right? And so the craft was built in Blender, was then transferred into Unreal. Uh, the so Unreal Engine. Let, let I, I forgot to mention. So Blender is the software we built the craft with. But then the software you 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 use to build environments is called Unreal Engine, and that's made by Epic Games. And it's been evolving for many many years. It's not a brand new thing, but it's evolved exponentially recently 
And so we're now at 5.3 in terms of Unreal Engine 5.3 is going to soon be evolving. And the, the tech, what, what you could do with Unreal Engine is like mind blowing today. So it's, it's taking something that is digital. It's taking something that is obviously not real. It's intangible, but you can create things in such a realistic way where we thought, well, if we have the technology now to do this, well, why not build the most uh, the most secret base in the world, a place where you can't go to at all? If you have somebody who was there and could help you guide guide you in how to build it, how inter- how how could that not be interesting? I mean, we could re- we could actually build the environment now for real. You could build walls and floors and doors. It, it's literally like your God building another yeah. world. Yeah. And as we we were evolving the tech, we started with Unreal Engine 4, and that was already good at the time. And it, then it, we then migrated it pretty fast to 5. And at, at first, we wanted to do, we were starting to focus on the VR component. So anybody who's a gamer who understands all this, it has to be uh, really, really optimized in order for somebody to have a VR experience. Otherwise, yeah. it's going to lag, and the the, we, the tech is not fully there for high quality, right? And as we were doing that, we said, but we still needed to look real. So we kind of shifted from that VR priority to the realism priority, which doesn't optimize it for VR traditional VR, but it certainly turns it into a cinematic environment. Right. And then it upgraded to five and the upgrades that kept adding to it were just miraculously at very, very well timed for cinema where you could actually start making movies with Unreal. And it's I mean, it literally is unreal. It's 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 really cool how this software has evolved. So I started hiring a whole bunch of people on the team that were experts at doing this. I mean, we had people out of Great Britain, Finland, Sweden, Lithuania. Uh, I had people, one guy in Japan at a certain point, Canada. And now the team is here. And it's like we built all the uh, Groom Lake facility. We built the Papoose Mountain Range, which is right by Groom Lake. We built the whole terrain, which is huge. We have a 10 square mile wide terrain in wow. Unreal. Yeah, it's freaking huge. Okay. And it's got the S4 facility by Papoose Lake. We built the entire nine hangars that Bob Lazar witnessed at one time, the corridor, the briefing room, all, all the things that he witnessed, we built with him. So he was there at every single step guiding us. Like, you know, we would ask him, okay, how, was, how, how was, should we build the, ha- the hallway? So he would explain that it, there was center blocks and, and traditional um, – uh, plaster walls and the colors of them and the floor. And so we would get information, build it, show it to him. He would look at it and go, actually, no, it wasn't exactly like that. So we, it's been like two years of making this perfect. And the technology also evolved with it. So we were able to even better the quality of these graphics as we went. And today we literally have and a fully operational military base with nine crafts, one of them being the sport model, everything is real size. So everything is completely 3D. If you put goggles on, which I, I do sometimes, and I, I go through <laughs> it, and it's, it's mind-blowing, it's real. Like You swear it's absolutely real. And we have... Uh, I guess for the people who are in this or people who are technically uh, proficient in Unreal, we got the UDS system in there. So we have real time uh, lighting, which, which is out to the sun, the moon, the nighttime lighting. Everything is is absolutely spectacular, uh, spectacularly lit. All our all our renders are going to be done through path tracing. So you have the final results are extremely realistic in terms of how the light bounces on on all materials. So it it literally looks like you have a real environment, which is what we wanted. And then we have Bob Lazar on a green screen 
He actually filmed with us in Montreal. So we actually take him, rotoscope him, bring him into Unreal. So he's walking in the re in the hangar, explaining <laughs> the craft wow. and explaining all that. So it, it's going to really be a visually pleasing experience because not only do you get to see what he saw, but you actually get Bob Lazar explaining it to you as if he was actually there. So that's that's going to be the... That's going to, I think that's going to be what people are going to appreciate the most. I mean, that's very exciting. You know, I do come from a bit of a gaming background, so I'm kind of familiar with Unreal and, and I've seen obviously demos of, of how it's evolved in recent times and it is incredible. The hyper realism is just phenomenal. So that is super exciting, but yeah. just, just going back to like the actual documentary, how, if you could explain how it differs from anything we've seen before when it actually comes to the movie itself. Well, we wanted to focus the whole Project Gravitor, because, you know, you've probably seen it. We advertise it under Project Gravitor, and sure. that's the main name of the project that we're working on, which includes the movie Lazar, the original whistleblower, the VR experience, the, um, the uh, sorry, the book that's going to come out. And then there's obviously going to be some really cool merchandising posters and all that with the visuals that we're creating. The main goal was to really address S4. So for a long time, we've all seen the, uh, the, the, the pro and cons, like people pro Bob Lazar or people against Bob Lazar and the arguments throughout the years about things like his education or things yeah. that he, they say they lied about this or he lied about this or he had gotten arrested or whatever. And that's something that's been covered many times very well in some in some cases, uh, in some other cases, not always in the best formats, but clearly was put out there uh, in, in good form. And there's been a lot has been said over the last 35 years that we don't want to go back to. It's been said. It's been written in books. It's been printed. It's been aired. What we don't have is visuals or real clear, um, real clear images of what he meant or what he saw. There's a lot of people, you know, when we started this project, we did a lot of research online on the online world, obviously, was our beginning where we were pulling as much information and the incredible amount of wrong data out there related to the Bob Lazar story was was astounding. Like, I mean, it was it was 80 percent crap and 20 percent accurate. And in many cases, it was not malicious. It was just misunderstood. So some people would take pieces of different interviews and then create their own idea of what it was. Or and then there was obviously the malicious ones were like they're using completely wrong data and attacking with. And we thought this is crazy. I mean, the information is not accurate. We we've, we've vetted everything that you'll see in Project Gravitor has been absolutely vetted by Bob Lazar himself. This is not something we perceived or might have understood. This is every single thing you'll see dimensions, colors, models, designs, times everything equipment you know is all something that bob lazar said was like that so you'll you'll have a much clearer understanding of what that facility looked like what that facility was doing what the propulsion lab where he was reverse engineer was trying to, attempting to duplicate a, a a gravity reactor what that looked like how that reactor functioned how the components came together, how that, how he said, you know, at a certain point you couldn't touch it. So how do you activate that? How do you deactivate that? There's a lot of people who've asked that question, but you don't really get to see it anywhere. So, and, and this phenomenon is so important. This, this, this research of this particular phenomenon of extraterrestrial technology, this particular one where it's the nuts and bolts of something that doesn't come from our star system. We have been talking about this for decades. It's, 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 been, it's been talked about across the, the globe for years. 
but we don't really have professional explanations of things. It's always, yeah, I heard that there was something like this and it did that. Well, if somebody worked on it, shouldn't we take the time to actually pull that data and try to recreate it perfectly so that we can explain what that means? So if somebody doesn't know if they believe it or not, at least they'll have an opportunity to see it better. If somebody who does believe it and wants to really better understand it, they'll have an opportunity to see it. And for the non-believers, we, we, we hope to at least entertain them with some good information. So at least it won't be something that's half, you know, half done or a little tacky or a little too, too artistic versus more technical and more real looking so that we could at least all have a clear idea of what all this stuff meant when he said that he worked on, on a gravity produce, producing reactor on a craft that you know had these archways and there was a waveguide and the gravity field looked like a heart around it. We want to understand that but really see it and not just drawings or little you know, anecdotal explanations, because a lot of times that's what happens is that information, like the, you know, the telephone game, is that what it's called? Like one person explains it to another and then they didn't get everything right. And that person got it wrong and then explains it wrong to another. And that's kind of what we saw online for, for the longest time. And we wanted to basically to correct it. And Bob literally said, the reason why I'm so interested in working with you guys is also because this is going to be finally put out there in good form so that there's, if anybody has any questions, just go check out whatever Project Gravitor did because that's it. That's what it is. So that's the, that's the main focus of the movie. It's what happened at S4. How did the technology work? How was he involved in it? How did he dismantle it when he says he dismantled it what does that mean what was understood of it what what he was told about it and i think that that goes a long way it has it, it never it's never been done in a visual format yeah absolutely and i think whether you're a believer or non-believer in bob's story i think it's still going to appeal to across the board you know i've sat on the fence for many years on bob's story because it ultimately I can't prove it a hundred percent. And so yeah. I'll always be respectful towards Bob and everything like that. And um, so, you know, I think that's the best way to deal with it. But can you tell me what role interviews play, you know, with key figures as well in, in the movie? Well, I mean, there's a lot of Bob in the movie. So, I mean, we have over 20 some hours of interviews wow. with Bob. So there's a lot of Bob and this is Bob explaining details about, the craft details about the reactor details about the base the people there his interactions with the people there um and going i guess a little bit more in depth on giving everybody a better visual of what what was there and what was going on uh we have interviews with uh, george knapp we've actually <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> we we had when we went to interview george knapp in las vegas we went there with bob lazar and we actually sat down and I didn't know this when we when this was happening. But as they sat down, George Knapp himself said, this is really interesting. You're the first guy who's interviewing me and Bob for the first time ever together. And I thought, really, I didn't know that. You know, I I had seen them together, but I never had I didn't I didn't know nobody ever interviewed them together, which was really cool. And so we have a really beautiful segment with George Knapp. George was extremely gracious with his time and bringing us a lot of good information in the interviews. He obviously touches some of the recent stuff that they, he and Jeremy have been working on with the congressional hearings and, and David Grush and all that stuff that's been going on, which is great. And you, you're there with Bob listening to this, which is really interesting. And they're, they're, they'll get into really good conversation. We have an exclusive uh, interview with Gene Huff, which was Bob's very close friend for the longest time. Gene hadn't accepted an interview for almost three decades. And wow. yeah. uh, when, when I initially was able to speak to Gene Huff, 
him and I hit it off really well right from the beginning. I could tell he was a very nice person, very kind, and very, it, it, like, my God, the guy has the best memory in the world because he remembered everything very well. And he was very helpful in giving us some tidbits. And Bob himself had actually said, you really want to listen to Gene because Gene has a better memory than I do. He, he goes, he might remember things that I don't even remember. Which is exactly what happened, by the way. It, you know, Gene was like, hey, I, there was this. And Bob was like, oh, my God, you're right. That was there. I forgot about that. So it was interesting to get Gene involved. And he said, you know, he goes, I'm very I, I asked him, I said, why did you say yes to me, to, to the team? He says, I am very particular with who I choose to work with. And he goes, you guys have certainly put in the effort and you deserve to have this because they saw what we built and we showed it to him. So he was pretty impressed with the fact that we built the entire thing. I think that helped a lot in his decision. So <clears throat> we got Gene Huff. We also got Mario Santa Cruz, which is one of Bob's very close friends. Uh, Mario was there when Bob was being uh, obviously followed or threatened after he came up, after he got caught at the uh, test flight in the desert. Uh, Mario's a super great guy, has remained very close friends with Bob over the last three decades. An incredibly good person who has given us so much uh, insight or inside info on how Bob is as a human being, not as the UFO guy, you know, because everybody looks at Bob, he's like, he's, that's the flying saucers guy from Area 51. But Bob Lazar is just a human being like we all are. And to speak to somebody who's been friends with him for three decades, and we felt the sincerity and the love from Mario, a, a really cool, good person who was so uh, helpful in explaining to us how Bob helped him out many years ago and giving us insight on how Bob is as a friend, as a person. And it, you could you could feel that you could feel that there's a human story there that is oftentimes not fully put out properly because we're focusing on the flying saucers. So there's a there's an aspect to that which really shows the humanity of the man. Uh, and that's besides the fact that I spent two and a half years with Bob and I could, I could say that and my whole team can say that, uh, you know, take away the flying saucers, take away Area 51 the guy himself is a super cool guy. He's a very nice person, down to earth, humble, very intelligent. And if you, if I have to base myself on my spider sense, he's not lying. That's right. that's mine. And I'll I'll go on I'll go on the public anytime and completely say if this guy is lying, then he's the best I've ever ever come across. So I spent a long time with him. You kind of feel people after a while. You kind of get a good idea. And he's 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 100% legitimate to me. Uh, so we have, like I said, we got George Knapp. We have Gene Huff. We've got Mario. Then we have, obviously, his wonderful wife, Joy, who was a great help throughout this time. She's amazing. We all love her. We interviewed with her. We have a beautiful interview of them together. And then we have... Um, well, we have a lot of really good stuff that's going to come out and be said in the in the interviews and in the film. So I'm I'm looking forward to everybody seeing that. Excellent, that is exciting. Uh, can I just pause one minute, Luigi? I'm just going to yeah. check my router. I'm getting some stability issues. Yeah. I will be back no one no second. Go ahead. Bear with.
All good? Yeah, I, I, I don't know if it's StreamYard or something. I'm, I'm on Wi-Fi. It might be just the walls. I'm still with this kind of new setup still, so I would just have to push through it. Yeah, that um, happens. It's tech. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately. Yeah. So, Luigi, were, the, were there any difficulties that stood out that really arose during production or pre-production or at any point? Uh, difficulties in terms of uh, our interactions with you and in general? Anything at all that really uh, stood out as like a real hurdle that you had to get over? Uh, well, I, I could tell you that everything is a hurdle <laughs> in life. Okay, so there's, there's, there's really no easy road out there. Okay, so I, what I will, I'll tell you, I'll tell you that there has been more than our, more than we anticipated of problems. But what I will say that we did not have any problems with, I think is the most important part, because it, it's something that is the opposite than what a lot of people would expect, is we have had the smoothest, most pleasurable ride throughout this entire time working with Bob, working with his wife, working with Mario, and even working with George and with Gene. So uh, the people involved were just perfect. I mean, everything was smooth. Bob was so kind in offering us a lot of his personal time. Uh, it, and that was something that we considered to be very important because we really wanted to get this straight. So he felt that he felt so that was great as far as so those that, that was all the positive stuff if you want to talk about hurdles well i could give you a whole bunch of hurdles and, <laughs> it, it, and that could go from logistics to uh, the the delorean time machine breaking down almost on its way to the to the to the desert but then we got it working thank god we got <laughs> We had to clean the DeLorean time machine after the desert shoot. That was a nightmare. Uh, we had to work with constant um, bugs in the system in Unreal Engine, which right. it's that's a that's a challenge. Okay, so uh, there's a lot of things that we've adapted and that we've gotten proficient in. In a, it, I would almost say in a very high sense uh, where we've programmed some of our own stuff we actually have a lot of things that are very particular to us in that and i i feel that it required us to have those hurdles in order for us to create a new let's say coding for certain things now right. that you know i i think it's an incredibly amazing engine and i think anybody who wants to dive into that will have will eventually have a blast doing it if you want to go all the way to cinema realistic cinema um and there's a lot of things that we've learned over time that i think were little hurdles here and there but we got them and generally speaking i guess the uh the biggest one we're facing now is completing the film so there's been a lot of uh chatter online people are like when is this coming out you know i we've i see that all the time my team sees that all the time and i do want to say you know we're we're right at the beginning of march of 2024 and i had anticipated the film to be completed by around the end of march when i initially posted something in 2023 and there's two things one i was wrong because it's not going to be done by end of march and that's on me but there's a good side to that is that we had a few breakthroughs that i can't really get into because it's proprietary stuff that in terms of what we're going to be doing for the film sure. and, and those breakthroughs were so important so big and that and it not, it's not only unreal engine related that we had to say all right if this if we could do this now obviously it elevated our budget significantly uh but we we wanted to do it we said if we can if we did all this so far 
and we could bring this story to this level. And now we have access to even elevating it more. Technically, it was a big decision and I'm saying it now, it's delaying the film, but it's going to make the film that much better. Trust me. Okay. And yeah. it, it's, I can't get into why, but believe me, it will really make everyone go, how did they do that? Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. 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 All so right. No, I'm, I'm yeah. with you. I'm with yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> so, I guess what, what else is there to say? I mean, what future plans would you say Project Gravitor has beyond its initial launch? So you've got the, the you, you've got the uh, movie, right? So you've got the documentary film that's going to be coming out as soon as we have a date. By the way, everybody's watching. We want a date more than anybody. OK, so we apologize for the delay and I'm letting you guys know I'm working on it like crazy. We're all working on it. After the movie is launched, we got to give the movie a little bit of time. So we have, uh, per, you know, we're, we're looking at a launch of a movie. It's going to get eventually distributed on platforms. There's going to be a lot of people are going to want to watch this. And we're going to have to go and do some traveling and, you know, some PR and promotion sure. stuff about this. And that also includes Bob. And in the meantime, when that happens... My team is going to be hard at work to finalize the virtual reality side of it. Because everything I talked about, because it's inside Unreal Engine, it's like a parallel project. So everything we're doing for the film is also getting designed for the VR experience. And that is a whole new world that not, nobody's ever seen before. Believe me, this is, a, this is a big one. To me, the VR experience is beyond exciting because I've seen it. And it's like, holy shit, you're going to be there for real. And everything is, you, it, everything is going to be interactive. So it's not, there's going to be the options where because of latency and because of you know, the power people are going to have on their computers or their goggles to do whatever, you're going to have the option of how if you have the big computers or go to an event that we're going to be at to show you this, you could do everything interactively in complete. It's you're going to freak. You, you, you'll be able to do everything. You'll be able to walk in the hallway, turn the lights on or off, open doors, go into the lab, play around with the reactor, put the pieces however they're supposed to take the reactor, go into the hangar, bring it into the craft, turn on the craft turn on the hangar door, bring the craft outside and fly to orbit with it. Okay. Whoa. Yeah. So this is going to work. Now that is for the people who have the ability or the capability to do that in terms of computing power, in terms of also the quality they'll see in the graphics. You right. could turn all that down, still do that, but turn down the quality. If you're on, you're having, you know, you're doing it on a laptop or, or doing it on some, you know, on a Mac, a MacBook Air or something, that that's going to be a different experience for you. Now, on top of that, we're going to have what NASA has done in their VR experience. In fact, one of the guys that's on my team is the one who made the NASA experience for oh, wow. the International Space Station. So it's like you, you film the inside of the hangar, example. It's like multiple cameras, 360 cameras. And now you're no longer in an interactive experience. So it, what we do is for everybody who doesn't have the computing power, if you just want to visit it and not interact with it, but you want it to right. look exactly real, then you'll have it where you put the goggles on and it'll be beyond amazing, but you're, you can only view it. So sure. there's, we're going to offer you the option of interacting with it or just viewing it. And both are equally cool, believe me. So that's going to happen, and that's going to be what the team is going to be involved in after the movie is launched. So we're basically finalizing that, you know, closing up all the little, basically finalizing the coding of all it and, and design, and then launching that. How that's going to get launched is as mysterious to me as how the movie is going to get launched right now. All I know, all I can say is, 
there's a couple of very gigantic platforms that have already approached us. So I'm just saying that. I'm not going to say we have deals with them. Sure. We don't, <laughs> we don't. But there's already people who have approached us. So that's in the works. And however that works, guys, pray for us that we get this, the best deals for this so that we could bring it to the world like we would like to have it. Then once the VR comes out, then we start finalizing our illustrated book, which is something that we consider to be, uh, it's going to be pretty cool because it'll be the first super high resolution illustrations that you've ever seen of flying saucers, whether it be of the craft, whether it be of S4, it'll be a book on S4. And following that is what we initially started all this with is a die cast model of the sport model. So there's a lot of steps to Project Gravitor. There's a lot of things going on, but rest assured, it's gonna, it, I'm, I'm really hoping you guys are gonna like it. I mean, it sounds incredible. I really, I really am excited. Um, where's the best place for people to keep up with the latest news and stuff as to how it's progressing? Everything is always, anytime we have something big to announce, we'll put it up on our Instagram page. It, it usually okay. goes Instagram, YouTube uh, is our best, is the best places. Our website, which is projectgravitor.com is also where we would highlight anything that's coming new, right? So if, if we have a date, you can rest assured it'll be everywhere. It won't just be on the Instagram and the website. We're going to, man, we're going to advertise the crap out of that like crazy. So, but if you want to follow our journey, follow us, you know, as we're making this, we like to show some people what's going on behind the scenes. We like to, I like to share some, you know, stuff of, of some of our imagery, some of our graphics. I think people are enjoying that because they're getting to see what kind of project this is. So, and sometimes we'll even have people calling us going, you guys are showing too much. What's going to be like <laughs> the movie, right? And trust me, we're not showing you enough. Okay. There's, there's, there's a lot that is going to be shown in the movie. So you got to You got to follow us. Yeah, absolutely. I'll make sure that all the links that we've, you mentioned are in the description of this video and Thank I wish you. you nothing but the best. Uh, and I'll say to anybody out there, whether you, whichever side of the fence you sit on with Bob Lazar, I think to support this project is, uh, is necessary and it's just going to be really new uh, and it's just going to break boundaries. So I wish you nothing but the best. Thank you. Really appreciate that. I, we can't wait for people to see it. And, and, and even for the people who don't like Bob Lazar, don't like the story, I will say this, whatever the case is, Bob himself said, whether you believe it or not, I hope that it gives you a little bit of, it, it, it's like a motivation of maybe some, some, something bigger is out there. Some, some, like a little bit of that wonder you know, yeah. so whether you believe it or not, that's not what we're not going to try to change people's minds, but it will certainly be something to see for the first time. Yeah. Can't wait. I really appreciate you coming to join me today, Luigi. Thank you so much. Thanks again. All right. Take care. Take care. Thank you. And to everyone watching, thank you as always. And we will see you on the next one. Goodbye.